Hello and welcome to our final video in our research unit. Our last topic that we're going to take a look at today is statistics. How do we use descriptive and inferential statistics in order to draw some conclusions about research? So let's go ahead and start here with an example, a set of data and an easy question. These are two individuals. Let's say these are their college GPAs from each semester. So four years of school, two semesters each year, we have eight different GPAs that are listed here. The question is, if you were a business person, if it came down to these two candidates, who would you hire? If all other things were equal, and this was the last piece of information you were using to make your decision. Now, obviously, we see some differences in GPAs here. Some people might want to hire Amy because she's very consistent. Karen, on the other hand, had some very high scores and very low scores. Someone might want to hire her because she has potential. We might need more information about what classes they were taking that led to these GPA. But this is some data that we can describe. And so this falls into what's known as descriptive statistics. Descriptive statistics summarize a set of research data is what helps us describe the information that we're presented with. Inferential statistics, we'll see here in a little bit, are ways that we can actually draw conclusions. Let's start though with descriptive statistics and some of the ways that we can report on the data that we see. The first way is through what's known as measures of central tendency. And this is something that you're probably all pretty familiar with. Things like mean, median, and mode. So we could take a look at Karen and Amy's scores and we could determine what their average is, what their median or middle score is, and what the mode or the most occurring scores are to help us describe in different ways a summary of the data that we see. Other things we can look at that are descriptive statistics include variability, which helps us look at the differences among scores. We can do that by looking at the range, so the difference between their lowest score and their highest score, which might show us again with Amy, her consistency. And we can also look at variance, which is the average difference between scores. And this will give us what we call the deviation score. Now, how do we find the deviation score? You're never gonna have to do this yourself in psychology class, but this is some background information that will lead us to the steps that we do need to take when it comes to descriptive statistics. If we wanted to find the deviation score for, say, Karen, for example, we would take each of her scores and subtract it from her average score and total them all up together. The problem is if we did this, the total score would actually end up being zero. So this does not quite work. Instead, what we have to do is we have to square the deviation and then divide by the number of scores. And this is going to give us a score that's known as the variance. Now, in psychology, the variance will always be given to you. What you will be expected to do with the variance is find what's known as the standard deviation, which is the average difference between each score. The standard deviation, the way that you find that, is to square root the variance. So how much math are you really going to have to do? Here's an example problem that you could be given on say a multiple choice test that you would have to find the answer to. So for example, the variance of a set of scores is 100. What is the standard deviation? Essentially, what is the square root of 100? And the answer of course is 10. Or you could be given one that is the variance is 25 what is the standard deviation? And hopefully we know that the answer is five. So that is the extent of the math that you'd be expected to do in psychology. The numbers will always be square rootable numbers. They'll always be easy numbers for you to find the square root of in order to determine the standard deviation. If your mean, median, and mode in your set of data all end up being the same, what we end up having is what's known as a perfect or a standard set of scores. And that is going to give us a standard bell curve. 
And if you look at the standard bell curve, there are different percentages that run along the top of the curve that you will want to know. They are 0 0.1, 2, 16, 50, 84, 98, and 99.9. .9. These will tell us where an individual falls within a series of scores. So if you've ever taken an exam and been told that you scored in the 98th percentile, that means you scored higher than 98% of the other people that took that test. So this is a descriptive statistic that helps us to describe an individual and where they fall compared to everybody else. So how do we describe where an individual falls compared to the rest of the population? There are two things that will always be given to you when looking at a standard bell curve, and that is the mean or the average score and the standard deviation. The mean or the average score is always going to be right in the middle of the graph. So this is what most people scored on, say, the SAT. That is going to go directly in the middle of our standard bell curve where 50% of the population scored that score. Then each time we increase by one standard deviation, our score is going to increase comparatively. So if the average SAT score, for example, is 500, then every time the SAT score increases by 100 points, you move up one standard deviation. So if you scored a 600, you are one standard deviation above the mean. If you scored a 700, you are two standard deviations above the mean. If you scored an 800, you're three standard deviations above the mean. And the same moving in the opposite direction. If you score a 400, you are one standard deviation below the mean, and so on. You can also report this by using what's known as a z-score, which again just tells us how many standard deviations above or below the mean someone falls. So a z-score of plus three means three standard deviations above, a z-score of minus two means that you're two standard deviations below. So you'll always be given the average score and the standard deviation. From there, you should be able to find where an individual falls compared to the rest of their peers, because you can increase by standard deviation each z-score to increase to find where an individual is or decrease if their score is below the average score. So the types of questions you'd be expected to answer when it comes to standard deviation and the standard bell curve, for example, could be that the average IQ score is 100 and the standard deviation is 15. What percentile does someone fall into who scored a 115 on the IQ test? So if you know that 15 is the standard deviation, that would be increasing the standard deviation by one. So that person would be one standard deviation above the mean and would therefore fall into the 84th percentile when we look at those numbers that are along the top of the bell curve. If someone scores a 130 on the IQ test, the question might be, what percentile do they fall under? And we would see that they are in the 98th percentile. So typically on the questions that you'd be asked, standard deviation, average score, and then either the percentile, the z-score, or the individual score will be given to you. Then using that information, you'll be able to determine the missing pieces of information. So if someone scored in the 16th percentile on an IQ test, you might be asked what that individual's raw score was. So we know if they are in the 16th percentile, they are one standard deviation below the mean. They therefore scored an 84 on the IQ test. I hope that makes sense in terms of what we can report on and how you'd be able to find it. We will do some additional practice to make sure that that makes sense. But finally, we need to look at what happens if the mean, median, and mode are not the same. If we don't have a perfect bell-shaped standard bell curve, what does that tell us about the data that we're looking at? We might see times where our mean or average score falls below the median, and that is referred to as a negative or a left skew. And this happens when there is a low score, a low number, that is going to pull our data to the left. So that is where we see a really long tail pulling our information off to the side. You can think of an example of this, such as a amateur golf tournament where one pro golfer joins in the competition. In golf, the lowest score wins. So while all of the other scores might be higher, 
our one professional golfer might have a really, really low score, and that's going to pull the average score down. That's why we see that long tail being pulled to the left. A positive or a right skew is what happens when the mean is greater than the median. And this usually happens when we have one outlier of a really high score, one high score pulling the data to the right, which causes this tail on the right side of the graph. This could happen for, say, example, home prices. If we have an average home price in a town and then someone decides to come in and build a giant mansion that is 10 times the price of a home in this town. Because this one home has such a high value to it, the average home price is gonna increase in our town, even though most of the houses, the median score is going to stay relatively the same. And that is why we might see this positive or right skew where we see the mean become higher than the median. The last thing we're gonna look at today is inferential statistics. And inferential statistics is when we actually draw conclusions from the data. This happens when we are doing an experiment. When we compare the results of say, the experimental group and the control group, how do we know the change that we saw is actually due to what was done in the experiment? Now looking at the data for our experiment, we can see that those that had the independent variable and the placebo both had an increase of their average heart rate after consuming either the coffee or the decaf but those who had the coffee had an even higher heart rate. So we do see that the coffee seems to have an impact on heart rate, but how do we know that it was actually the coffee and not anything else? We would have to do some data analysis here. And luckily for us in psychology, we're not going to have to do the math, but eventually what we're going to end up with is what's known as a p-value. And a p-value shows us the statistical significance of our research data. Basically what it's telling us is the probability that our results are actually due to what we did in the experiment and how much was actually due to chance. So in psychology, our p-value, our statistical significance exists when p is less than 0.05. That means that there's less than a 5% chance that we got our results on accident or due to a confounding variable meaning that there's more than a 95% chance that what we did in our experiment, our independent variable, actually caused the results that we see. Again, you're not going to have to calculate this yourself, but you are going to have to explain what a p-value is. So if you see a p-value of 0.03, you can say that that experiment was statistically significant. It's a valid experiment because the results are due to what we did in the experiment that there's a very small probability we got those results on accident. But if a p-value is 0.25, we can say that that is statistically insignificant, that there's a 25% chance that we got those results due to a confounding variable, and that's too great of a chance. The experiment is not valid, and we would have to change the parameters or control for some more confounding variables in order to make sure that our results are due to what we actually did in the experiment. So that is research and statistics in psychology. This is how we collect data to actually prove what we think we know about human behavior and thought process. This is how we can actually make meaningful and significant changes in individuals' lives by knowing what is actually going to make a difference to make the way that we think or act be better for ourselves and for our society. I hope you can use this information as you go out into the world to think critically about the information you're presented with and find ways to make the world a better place. Thanks for watching and remember, be kind to your mind.